Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Harris, and I am pleased to welcome you on behalf of the National High School Center at AIR and the American Youth Policy Forum to this webinar on college and career readiness in students with disabilities. This is the third in a series of Tuesday webinars in June that focus on a variety of issues and practices related to college and career readiness. You may still register for the remaining webinar at the provided link or access archive recordings at any time on our website and the YouTube channel. For those looking to access last week's webinar on link learning and multiple pathways, there was a slight delay due to, the tech, due to a technical recording glitch, but the archive is now posted and the YouTube version with closed captions will be posted tomorrow. So let's, in our, our, web, our agenda for today, after brief opening remarks, we will hear a series of perspectives on college and career readiness and students with disabilities from our diverse group of presenters. Lou Danielson, a lifelong special educator, currently serves as the center director for the National Center on Intensive Intervention a a and as a senior advisor to the National Center on Response Intervention and a senior research director to the National High School Center. His previously held leadership roles in the U.S. Office of Special Education Programs, including program lead for the Research to Practice Division. Recently, Lou received the J.E. Wallace Wallen Lifetime Achievement Award at the CEC National Convention. Betsy Brand has served as the Executive Director of AYPF since 2004. Her career in education, workforce, and youth policy education policy includes a 1989 appointment as the Assistant Secretary for Vocational and Adult Education at the U.S. Department of Education, where she worked for four years. Keith Ozels is the Youth Transition Programs Coordinator for Oregon's Youth Transition Program at the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, which serves students with disabilities in 55 school districts and more than 115 high schools throughout Oregon. Deborah Hart is the Educational Coordinator at the Institute for Community Inclusion and has over 30 years of experience working with youth and adults with disabilities, their families, faculty, and professionals that support youth. Currently, she is the director of three national post-secondary education grants which focus on understanding and improving outcomes of post-secondary education options for youth with intellectual disabilities. Before we begin our presentations, I want to share a few housekeeping items. All phones will be muted throughout the presentation due to the large number of participants. You may still communicate with us in two ways. First, the chat box on the right of your screen is for general comments or to seek technical help. Enter your comments into the text box and press send. Please send all technical questions to the host in the pull down menu where it says send to and all other questions to all panel. I'm sorry, all other comments to all panelists. We will be seeking your comments on several discussion questions later in the presentation. You may similarly use the Q&A text box located directly below the chat box to send any questions to be addressed during our Q&A session after the presentations. Questions should be directed to all panelists using, again, the same type of pull-down menu unless you have a private question to one of the presenters that you'd like to be answered offline um, at a future time. We will collect all questions and all um, comments and post them later on our community of practice. Uh, we'll give you more information about that later in the presentation. Another feature for providing feedback that we'd like to share today is polling. Let's use this option to identify who our participants are today. Please click on the radio button to indicate whether you work primarily in special ed only, general ed only, both, or neither. Click one of the buttons and then press submit at the bottom of the uh, white box on the right of your screen. Let's everybody who has access to a computer uh, pull, uh, make one of those choices, please. We'll wait about 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. So we can see we have a broad range of, present, of uh, participants and we'll be able to uh, um, address your individual questions as I said later in the presentation. 
So that's the housekeeping. We've got a lot of information to share, so I'm going to quickly turn over uh, the agenda to um, Lou Danielson to start off the presentation. Lou? Thanks, Joe. Um, so you might be asking why focus on college and career readiness um, and students with disabilities. Um, many of you are probably aware that the President has set a goal for participation in post-secondary education for all students. And in this case, I'll emphasize the all students. I think we're at a point in time where it's realistic to think about the possibility of all students with disabilities participating in post-secondary education programs. In a moment, Betsy will talk about uh, some of the statistics we currently have available on post-secondary participation um, at the current point uh, for students with disabilities. I think we're encouraged that we've seen growth over the past two decades, substantial growth in participation of students with disabilities in post-secondary education. We're also at a point now where, for the first time, we're seeing programs develop for kids with uh, intellectual disabilities uh, to provide access to post-secondary education. So I think there's a lot of reasons for being very optimistic about the President's goal. In uh, data collected through the National uh, Longitudinal Transition Study recently, we see that the vast majority of kids with disabilities, over 80% of kids with disabilities have as an expectation that they will go on to post-secondary education uh, opportunities. Uh, sadly, it's often the case that parents and professionals have somewhat lower expectations, and I think this is one of the things that we'll ultimately need to address is the role that the expectations of professionals as well as parents have that sometimes limit the aspirations of uh, kids with disabilities. What's important about today's webinar is that we're going to talk about some of the challenges uh, and some of the opportunities we have uh, for creating the kinds of improvements that are necessary in the K-12 system to address uh, issues or impediments and as well as opportunities for enhancing the preparation and readiness of students with disabilities for post-secondary education and uh, careers. Um, one other, I think, very important factor uh, um, to consider as we uh, talk about these issues is for those of us that have worked in uh, disability issues, we know that if schools, if the K-12 system is doing a good job in preparing kids with disabilities for post-secondary op opportunities, it's very likely going to improve the degree to which schools provide opportunities for other students. Uh, that may not have disabilities, but but may who may also be challenged to some degree uh, in their aspirations to ascent, attend post-secondary education. So ultimately, I think the impact of many of the things that we might do will benefit kids well beyond just those kids with disabilities. Um, having kind of set the stage, I'm uh, now going to turn it over to uh, to Betsy Betsy Brand, then the director of the American Youth Policy Forum. Great. Thank you, Lou, and um, thank you, Joe, also for um, your work in organizing this uh, webinar. We're very excited to be partnering with you on this. Um, before I begin, I just want to um, say a word about the American Youth Policy Forum for those that may not be familiar with our organization. We provide professional development for policymakers and practitioners and provide information on strategies, programs, and policies that help young people be successful in life, careers, and civically. Uh, we've conducted many programs and developed numerous publications on college and career readiness for all kinds of youth, uh, particularly vulnerable youth, and you can access those materials on our website. Uh, AYTF has been partnering with the National High School Center to develop a paper on college and career readiness for students with disabilities. And today I'm going to briefly describe the main themes of that paper. And the paper will be disseminated later this summer, and we'll make sure that everybody who participates in the webinar today receives a copy. Um, the purpose of the webinar is not only to provide a summary of the paper, but also to gather your input on strategies and policies that support students with disabilities as they prepare for college and careers. So we want to leave time at the end to get your comments, feedback, and questions and also to participate in the communities of practice that you'll hear about later on. So 
So my outline for today's webinar is uh, first to review some of the findings and themes of the draft paper. And so I'm going to start with um, some data on college and career readiness for students with disabilities, um, what it takes in terms of skills and abilities to be college and career ready, uh, what some of the important elements of a college and career ready system are, um, and then talk about some of the, the real meat of the paper, we think, examples of statewide programs that help students with disabilities become college and career ready. And I'm going to uh, briefly describe two, but we're very fortunate to have two live presenters with us to talk about their programs. Um, and then we'll return and talk about policy issues. So I'm going to cover the first four, then we'll switch to our um, presenters from Oregon and Massachusetts, and then we'll come back. So let me start with some data points that help frame the challenges that face us in this work. Um, the focus on education reform has recently shifted and is really being driven by the need to ensure that all students are prepared for success in college and careers. Data from the Georgetown University Center of Education and the Workforce show that we must increase the number of Americans that have some type of post-secondary education credential, whether it's an industry certified credential, an associate's degree or higher, but that we are actually falling short of that number by at least 3 million individuals. And on top of that, the U.S. will need at least 4.7 million new workers with post-secondary certificates to meet the emerging labor market demand. I do just want to reiterate that when I use the word college for the purposes of this presentation, that I do mean to include the full range of post-secondary education options from a one-year, two-year, or four-year program apprenticeships, and structured, formalized workforce training and education. Given this data, our education system clearly needs to vastly improve the number of young people who are prepared to enter post-secondary education, succeed in post-secondary education, and enter into a solid career. We know that there are big achievement gaps between certain groups of students, including students with disabilities, and the next few slides will illustrate these gaps. So this slide shows the post-secondary education enrollment rate, so those getting in within four years of high school for youth with disabilities compared to youth in the general population from 1990 to 19, uh, I'm sorry, to 2005. Blue is uh, 1990, yellow is 2005. And while there's been significant improvement for all students and solid improvement for students with disabilities, they still lag behind their peers, and only 45% of students with disabilities enter some form of post-secondary education compared to 62% of students without disabilities. This next slide shows the post-secondary completion rates by degree for young adults with disabilities compared to young adults in the general population. Overall, 52% of young adults complete a post-secondary degree of some sort within eight years after high school, compared to only 40% of young adults with disabilities. So again, there are major gaps. Interestingly enough, however, students with disabilities do better than the general population at community colleges, signaling that this is a key entry point for them. Um, this slide uh, addresses employment outcomes, and students with disabilities also lag in employment outcomes, but not a great surprise when you know that post-secondary education is becoming the baseline for holding a job in today's economy, and young adults with disabilities have always faced barriers to employment. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, only a little more than half of students with disabilities were competitively employed eight years after high school. And the definition of competitive employment refers to those that are receiving more than the minimum wage and working in an environment where the majority of workers are not disabled. The unemployment rate in 2011 for, the disabled, for disabled adults was 16.2, uh, while the rate for non-disabled adults was 8.8, .8, almost twice. And in addition to lower rates of employment, workers with disabilities are, more, are much more likely to be employed part-time uh, compared to their non-disabled peers. The last data slide I want to share um, reflects the, the gap between students with disabilities based on family income. And there are vast differences in access to post-secondary education based on the income levels of students with disabilities and their families. 
uh, just as there are with non-disabled students. And this chart demonstrates the extremely large differences for students in low, middle, and high income families, as you can see. Again, while some progress has been made from 1990 to 2005, the data make clear that we need to do a much better job ensuring equity and access to post-secondary ed for students with disabilities in general, but particularly we need to focus on those from low and middle income families. So given that background and context, what does it take for students with disabilities, and, and I would say probably all students, to be college and career ready. So the list that's on the slide in front of you is drawn from work that the American Youth Policy Forum conducted several years ago when we wrote a publication entitled Success at Every Step, How 23 Programs Support Youth in the Path to College and Beyond. And it draws upon the National High School Center's College and Career Development Organizer. There are many other organizations who have drafted up similar lists. You probably are familiar with them. So it's not unique, and while the language may be different across different groups, the concepts that are presented here are pretty similar. I think what's important is that this list encompasses many different types of knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors, not just academic knowledge, and it's a comprehensive approach to helping young people be college and career ready. So I will quickly go through the list. I don't want to spend a lot of time on here, but just to mention a couple of points um, for each. Um, clearly, fundamentals of academic preparation are key for all students. Uh, they should not need remediation when they enter post-secondary education. Um, some, some individuals and groups feel that the first bullet is what college and career re ready should be about, um, and that is really important. But as I said before, all of these other items below that first bullet are critical. So, but academic preparation is definitely the foundation. Um, college knowledge refers to kind of knowing the steps to prepare for college, understanding the application process, finding the right college for you, um, and applying for and navigating the financial aid system. So for many uh, low income and disadvantaged uh, students, students with disabilities, this is a big challenge and programs um, need to recognize that all young people need this college knowledge and awareness. Uh, career awareness and planning, especially for students with disabilities, uh, needs to include transition planning as well. Um, there's a huge lack of career planning in general for students, um, but a, a critical point for them to be able to plan their future. Um, social and emotional skills are very important as well. Uh, oftentimes we neglect these when we talk about skills that are needed by students to be successful. But when you figure that if we're not dealing with the emotional well-being of young people, they, they probably won't be too focused on their academics. And social skills obviously are needed to get along with others. So it, these include skills like resiliency, self-management, getting along with others. And given that many students suffer from mental health and emotional if issues and also from difficult family um, challenges, this is an area that needs to be addressed. Higher order thinking skills are, are I think, pretty common, commonly known, um, problem solving, critical thinking, reasoning. But oftentimes these skills are not developed in classroom settings, but sometimes better developed in non-classroom settings or other opportunities for learning. Um, if students are interested in um, working, which we hope they all will, um, they need to have skills that employers desire and want, such as teamwork, good communication, and reliability. Uh, it helps for students to also know something about the occupation and the career pathway that they want to enter and to begin building a technical set of skills. And self-determination is important to ensure that students have the skills and self-knowledge to identify their needs, their desires, that they can advocate for themselves, and that they can persevere as they address and travel through multiple systems and transitional periods. So if one were to design a system of college and career readiness for students with disabilities, we think that this is a list of elements that needs to be incorporated. And I certainly hope that as we go through um, the webinar today that people feel free to send in comments and questions and um, your own thoughts on, on this list as well. 
So there is a wide range of knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors that students with disabilities need to be college and career ready. And it's a very involved, complex process to help students be prepared for a self-sufficient adult life. Any of us who have worked with young people or have our own kids, we know that it is a challenging process to raise a young adult to be successful, independent, self-sufficient. So here are a couple of the elements that we think need to be in place. Um, first of all, as Lou had mentioned, high expectations and aspirations are critical. And all the adults and educators that are around in the environment of young people and students with disabilities need to set clear goals for students with disabilities based on their abilities and their interests. Uh, everyone needs to embrace a culture and belief system that students with disabilities are capable of high level work and that they can succeed in post-secondary education and meaningful careers. As the need for post-secondary education skills is increasingly mandatory, students with disabilities should now be expected to attend some type of post-secondary education. So we all need to set expanded and higher goals for these students. Educators need to have better understanding of the unique needs of students with disabilities and be able to envision and implement powerful learning experiences for them. Both general and special education uh, educators need to learn how to use data to assess learning needs and to design personalized instructional programs for them. And a lot more could be said about professional development and the needs um, both for general and special ed teachers in this area. Um, students with disabilities must have access to a high level curriculum and very soon that will include the common core standards that are pegged to college readiness. So this will be a major undertaking to train and retrain both general and special educators to help all students with disabilities access a higher level curriculum and effectively manage and pass the new assessments that are also being developed. And again, this will require a great deal of training. Um, with regard to the next bullet, guidance, counseling, and transition. Uh, many students lack good guidance and counseling. Uh, and particularly given the low number of counselors in many schools, uh, sometimes where the student to counselor ratio can be 500 students to one counselor. So it's a challenge for students with disabilities to get the, the advice and support that they need. And they need transition planning um, as, required by IE, as, uh, as required by the IDEA law. Um, and just as some students lack family support, students with disabilities might need much more guidance when they think about transitioning to pathways, um, I'm sorry, transitioning to post-secondary education, careers, and ultimately to independent living. It's not an easy transition to make for many young people. Um, and we need to find ways to provide that guidance and counseling to them. Um, a challenging issue, I think, is uh, the options that are available for high school uh, diplomas for students with disabilities. Um, states are continuing to experiment with high school diploma options by providing a range of options, such as alternative diplomas that um, many students with disabilities uh, receive. And while alternative diploma options may be positive, and it might be a positive goal for some students, it's important to clarify the implications of developing and granting these alternative diploma options. And it's very important to ensure that students with disabilities have access to regular and advanced diploma options, not just uh, alternative diploma options, but also that their families understand the differences between these uh, high school options early on so that they can plan for and ensure that their student, that their child is taking the right courses. Um, just real quickly, the last two I'm not going to spend time on, but K-12 and post-secondary ed need to work to align their curriculum in many ways. And K-12 needs to work more closely with many of the other providers um, that are offering services to students with disabilities. Very briefly, this is just to demonstrate and show you the National High School College and Career Development Organizer, uh, strands one and two. This is a very short, nice, easy, um, visual way to capture almost everything that I just said. So I congratulate Joe, Lou, and all the other folks at the National High School Center for developing this. Um, it's a great little checklist for you all to use as you're thinking about developing a college and career ready system. 
Um, I want to briefly touch on two programs um, before we turn to our two live uh, program representatives. Um, and the paper will go into more detail on this. Um, these are programs that we have discovered um, are helping in, uh, students with disabilities succeed in various ways. Uh, the first one is called Apex Renew. You can see the title on the slide. Um, it was uh, supported by the Department of Education as a three-year project um, initially in 2002 and has become a very, very successful model in collaboration between the New Hampshire State Department of Education, University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability, and the Alliance for Community Supports. And it's designed to significantly reduce high school dropout rates, implement school-wide positive behavioral systems in, in high schools, provide intensive and individualized school to career services to current students who have dropped out of school or students who are considered to be at risk. And it also strengthens the state education agency's capacity to implement these proven dropout prevention strategies through comprehensive and high quality professional development and technical assistance. And data on the Apex Renew program show that between school year 2003-04 and school year 2008-09, uh, 15 high schools reduced their average annual dropout rate by more than half, from 6.3 to 2.5, and, and they also showed other positive indicators with regard to improvements in school, work, home, and emotions. Uh, Graduate First in Georgia is a statewide initiative that uses a data-driven intervention framework developed by the National Dropout Prevention Center for Students with Disabilities to address issues that have negatively impacted school completion rates. Graduate First has a two-fold mission aimed at increasing graduation rates for students with disabilities who receive, it, who receive a general education diploma and decreasing the dropout rate for students with disabilities. To date, 145 schools in Georgia participate, serving over 4,000 students. Collaboration coaches are hired to work with school-based team leaders to help students with disabilities and their families navigate through the uh, various resources and programs and their strategic and analyzing issues that have negatively impacted the school completion rates of those students. In 2008, only 37 percent of Georgia's students with disabilities graduated from high school. In 2011, after the impl implementation of Graduate First, the graduation rate for Georgia's students with disabilities rose to 43 percent, from 37 to 43. And in one high school, the graduation rate rose from 43 to 85 percent. So two great programs. But we're now going to move to um, our live presenters. So our first uh, presenter you already heard introduced will be Keith Ozels from Oregon uh, Youth Transition Program. And he will be followed by Deborah Hart, who's the uh, educational coordinator at the Institute for Community Inclusion in Massachusetts. So Keith, you're up. All right. So again, uh, my name is Keith Ozels, and I am the statewide coordinator for the Youth Transition Program. And I'm going to be talking about our program and how we have been able to utilize interagency collaboration to prepare students with disabilities for that college and career readiness to make a, a successful transition. So the, the overview of the project of the Youth Transition Program is that it's a partnership between my office, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, and we provide the funding and the administration of the program. It's a grant program to school districts. It, we offer grants every two years on a biennium schedule. And this biennium, we're, we have about $8 million going out in grant funds to school districts. There are 55 school districts throughout the state of Oregon that run YTP, and those districts run them in about 115 high schools. So we at the Office of Oak Rehab, we provide the funding and then the administration and a lot of the, the partnership with the other organizations, which you'll see below. the. University of Oregon and the Department of Education and the local school districts. The Department of Education provides a lot of the um, guidance around IDEA and then FAPE and other legislation that will help the students that we're working with make that smooth transition. 
And then the University of Oregon, they provide a lot of the technical assistance to the, the individual YTP sites, and they also provide um, curriculum and a lot of the, uh, the kind of, I guess, in some ways we call it a, a marriage counselor role between the local branch offices of VR and then the school districts that are bringing the students to the VR branch offices. So they'll work with the, the different um, technical assistance providers in providing that service. Now the public schools, those 55 districts that have YTP grants, they will actually hire staff to work directly with the students. Those staff members are called transition specialists and they work to, to basically recruit students and then provide a pattern of service to them and then bring them to VR and connect them to their local branch office and the, the voc rehab counselor in their region to make sure that they're connected when they exit the program, they'll be receiving the VR services and even be receiving VR services before they leave the, the secondary school setting. I'm gonna get into a lot of the, um, the, the pattern of service and the service delivery model in a few slides, but just to give you an overview of the, the way the program works at a state level, those are the agencies that are participating. And then over the past 20 years, we've been able to provide service to over 20,000 students with disabilities. So on the next couple of, well, let me move to this one to talk about goals and what the goals of the youth transition program are. It's essentially to prepare students with disabilities for employment or a career-related post-secondary education that will help them achieve some sort of uh, goal that they've identified. And that, that really comes, um, I, I think that it, 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 it's a really important piece of this model because when we're looking at IDEA and the Rehabilitation Act in terms of what the definition of transition service is, it's a, it states that it's a coordinated set of activities that are designed with an outcome-oriented process that promotes movement from school to a post-school activity. And that's where the Department of Education and VR, where we're both mandated to work almost uh, word for word on the same goals of that transition and what that definition of transition is. So we're trying to create a new pattern of service through the youth transition program to meet those needs of the students. So when we're talking about the students, in the next couple of slides I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, the demographics of students we're working with. This is from the last biennium from 2009-2011 and you'll see that the students in the program, is, they're primarily students with specific learning disabilities at about 64%. Then the next uh, group is other health impairments, students with ADHD, epilepsy, leukemia, other, other health impairments. And then we move down to emotion, uh, EVD, speech and language, autism spectrum, and ID and DD students. But in this, in this uh, biennium, we're seeing that there's actually an increase in students on the spectrum, and then we're also make a, making a concerted effort to identify and work with ID students because it's a, it's, uh, I think it, it's an increased prevalence that we're seeing in the state of Oregon, and we're, we're making that effort to engage and work with those students. So the demographics this year are a little bit different. They look, it's about 50% learning disabilities, and then um, autism spectrum and ID are up to about 15% each. And with the students that we work with, we identify specific barriers that they have to uh, employment and then also post-secondary education. 66% of the students, they lack appropriate transportation and available transportation to them. Many of the students in Oregon live in very rural settings, so they're, it's just very difficult to be able to get to a college or a training setting or even to be able to get to a, a work site where they can develop work skills and work experience. And on that note, 56% of the students have no prior work experience and no history when they get enrolled in the youth transition program. So that's one of the primary um, barriers to employment that we see for them. And then 50% are low income or live in poverty, and then 34% have a difficult family circumstance, which, um, which really, it, it, you know, that can be seen as uh, just lower expectation. Betsy made a, a good point about that, that, that many times parents have low expectations and, and really don't know about what options are available to their students. So that's a, a 
pretty big barrier that we do see with our students we're working with. Now to move on to the outcomes for the students in the program, this is kind of the good news. We have the students that exit the program, 86% of them exit high school with a completion certificate with a standard diploma, a modified diploma. They're actually going through school and graduating and that's it's a pretty high outcome for the students we're working with. And when they are engaged in employment, they're employed at $9.23 an hour, which is about 75 cents higher than the uh, minimum wage in Oregon, which is also a, a pretty nice outcome for the students we're working with. And then in the engagement on this uh, bar graph where it has 76% are engaged at exit, we measure engagement as the students being in education, in some sort of post-secondary education or training, or they're actually employed. So it can be a combination of those two or one or the other. And then we follow up with them at six months and we'll see that 79% are still engaged. And then at 12 months, 78% of the students are still engaged. And, and that piece of the YTP model is really um, enticing to school districts because of things like indicator 13 and 14 that are you know, mandating that schools follow up with students after they graduate up to one year. And if you can show that your program has a 78% engagement model, it's a, it's a very good thing for schools. Now to dive more into the actual program model and what we do, we rely on interagency agreements and MOUs. And I talked about that at the state level where we're working with the, the Department of Education. We're also working with the Oregon Developmental Disability Services Group and with, um, with the, the local school districts to sign these interagency agreements. And in those agreements, we're saying that we will all work together, collaborate to outreach and identify students who are in need of these transition services that we're all going to collaborate towards meeting those transition needs and to pool our resources within the school districts and then with the, um, the traditionally seen adult agencies like VR, but that do provide those transition services. And then really to facilitate uh, an effective transition for students from secondary education into post-secondary employment or, or post-secondary education. So down at the bottom, you'll see that we have in the school system, we have the IEP model or the Individualized Education Plan. And then moving into my agency at VR, we have a very convenient and sometimes confusing acronym, the IPE, which is the Individualized Plan for Employment. And then if we have this agreement that we're going to work together, that plan can really translate from the, the school setting to the post-school setting. And we really see that if we start working earlier with the students before they leave secondary education, they're going to be much more successful and lead into those outcomes I uh, described in the previous slide. So when we're thinking about that, how can we actually make that happen? How can we start to collaborate earlier? And that's where the YTP program really comes in and where the transition specialists who are employed in the schools are, are doing that very thing. What they do is the transition specialists will develop a plan with the students that they're working with. And really what they're doing is they're building a good relationship with them. They're, they're in many cases, they're becoming mentors and they're, they're also, um, they're providing a lot of those transition services, guidance and counseling that Betsy had mentioned before. They're identifying the student's strengths and maybe what some of their barriers are. Then they're going to identify local services and supports that can help them overcome those barriers or functional limitations. They're going to work with them to develop community work experiences and then hopefully 18 months before they exit the program, they're going to have them engaged in a paid work experience so they're developing, they're developing that, that, um, that concrete work experience that can translate hopefully into a paid employment after they exit the secondary system. And then they're also obviously going to work with them on creating and, and submitting an application to VR so they can become a VR client. The, uh, the transition specialist will also work with them on things like life skills training. They're going to work with them on identifying other services in their community like that, that transportation issue I mentioned earlier. They're going to develop a relationship so they can work with the students 
through their secondary education and then on after they exit the program. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And the, the transition specialist in the school setting is also going to be monitoring the progress and putting data into our database, the YTP database, where we track the students and where we're able to pull out all of the, um, the outcomes that we've, that we've basically been able to produce through this program. And then they're going to work with their local VR office to create their, their individualized plan for employment, and then they're going to help the voc rehab counselor modify that plan and, and make adjustments to it if, if it needs when they're uh, getting ready to, to leave secondary education. Now when the students are getting ready to exit the school system, they will work with their transition specialist and th when they graduate from high school, they're hopefully going to transition into employment or into um, some sort of education or training program, something like an apprenticeship or a career pathway at a local community college. The transition specialist at the school setting will follow up with the student and work with them for a full year afterwards. And what that means is that they're going to check in with them, make sure that they're, they're um, on track to be able to uh, complete their education, or if they're employed, then they can offer those post-secondary and uh, post-employment um, vocational uh, services, which basically can be intervention and in working with a job developer or working with the, the employer directly to provide those job training skills. And that's the model of the program in a really quick nutshell in being able to provide this YTP service from enrollment to the exit and, and follow up with the students so they're, they're successfully placed in employment and post-secondary uh, education. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for our website because there's much more information there and I don't have it on this slide, but it's ytporegon.org and that's where you can find out a lot more information about YTP and definitely if you have more questions, you can follow the, uh, the instructions that Joe gave earlier about submitting them on the right hand of the, uh, the, uh, the webinar right now. But that concludes uh, my quick presentation on YTP, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Um, I'd like to first thank the National High School Center for the opportunity to present on the inclusive concurrent enrollment today. Before I get to that, I'd like to give you just a little brief background on what's happening nationally regarding post-secondary education for students with intellectual disabilities. Uh, Think College is about, started about uh, exactly in 2008, and we conduct research, uh, deliver training, disseminate information, and coordination of post-secondary education for students with intellectual disabilities nationwide. Then, next slide, shows you um, a lot of the Think College activities. Uh, the blue states are where Think College has been working to grow the choice of post-secondary education for students with intellectual disabilities. The red stars are the 27 model demonstration programs that were funded under the um, by the Office of Post-Secondary Education under the uh, reauthorization of the Higher Education Opportunities Act. In, um, th these were awarded in 2010. The Yellow Star is the coordinating center for those, and that is also at um, Think College. I wanted to share that with the national picture with you because of those 27 model demonstrations, there are 22 that are dual or concurrent enrollment. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, to talk a little bit uh, on the inclusive concurrent enrollment, it is not one of those model demonstrations. This actually began in the late 90s with, um, when we had a model demonstration program from the Office of Special Education Programs. And it was so successful in creating an alternate pathway into higher education for students who traditionally had the most significant disabilities and had been excluded from higher education. That in, uh, I think it was 2004,
2004, we began working with an advocacy organization. And in 2006, there, we were successful in getting a line item in our state budget. We are now in our sixth year. The line item started at um, $2 million and has been reduced each year to now anywhere between um, 400 and 600,000. It's, um, and, and the reason for the reduction is given the economy, uh, w w we're shocked that we even were able to survive the, these last six years. Basically, this is seed money that it is administered through our uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in partnership with the Department of Higher Education through a grant program. There are seven partnerships across the state both two-year and four-year, and the map shows exactly where they are. Um, I'm not going to read that to you. You can see that for yourself. Um, what do I mean when I say dual or concurrent enrollment? Exactly, students are 18 to 22 in Massachusetts. Our, our state law goes to 22. Whoops. And um, students are, who are still supported by their school district. So they're still served by their high school, but most of their day and services and activities take place on a college campus. OK. This is really, when we first started, we looked at what was happening for uh, in higher education to support students with disabilities. And what we were able to find was a, sport, a supported education model that was really designed initially to support students with mental health challenges. It has much more um, wraparound and intensive supports. And we also looked at what was happening w for students in high school in creating a pathway into a higher education experience. And it was usually mostly for students with, um, who, were, who were given the label of talented and gifted. So we took those two concepts and looked at um, an inclusive concurrent enrollment approach so that it, it is really um, a very authentic post-secondary education experience for the students. It's really built on uh, empowering students using a person-centered planning approach and developing somewhat of a, not somewhat, a leadership team within the partnerships that contain, it's an interagency team that have all the adult agencies on it along with the um, college or university and the school district. Again, because it's really focusing on transition. That team has an emphasis on looking at developing a braided funding strategy for students. The overall purpose of the program is really looking at building better partnerships between public high schools and state insti uh, public institutions of higher education really designed to look at an authentic, inclusive college experience, again, for students with intellectual or severe disabilities, with the overall purpose of improving post-school outcomes for students with intellectual disabilities. In Massachusetts, um, in the past, over 80% of students who were identified with intellectual dis disabilities we're going into sheltered workshops and day habilitation centers. So this was really designed to um, circumvent that undesirable outcome. The entrance criteria is that the student must not have passed our um, comprehensive assessment exam. They have to be between the ages of 18 and 22 and they have to want to go to college. The supports that are provided range from natural supports all the way to typical 
disability support services like note takers and tutoring to educational coaches and peer mentors. This is the unique feature of the majority of these programs, both within Massachusetts and nationwide. There are ad additional supports, and that the degree of those supports are based on the student's needs. And technology and universal design for learning are some of the key aspects of the, this program. Here's a listing of some of the sample courses. I, I will spare reading all of them to you, but you can see that they are across a broad range of academic, business, technology, arts, career exploration, and wellness. The outcomes are really around supporting and empowering the student to begin to identify a career goal and to learn how to advocate for their own um, choices across different domains. I think the real story we're going to see as this unfolds in the future is that it's really about how students acquired the career and more of the soft skills by taking authentic college credit and non-credit courses and being with their peers without disabilities. The main goal and, or outcome is really around the, having the student be in an integrated competitive employment before they exit their school system. Here's a, uh, an example of some of the, a sample of the jobs that students have had, actually paid, both paid internships and um, competitive employment. And you, as you can see, there's a wide range all the way from medical, working at colleges, pet groomers, uh, that's a very popular uh, career for young women, it appears. Um, but bottom line, again, I can't emphasize this enough, is that it, it's really about um, gaining knowledge and work skills that result in integrated competitive employment. This is... Um, the Think College website, it's thinkcollege.net. I would encourage you to go on there um, if you're interested in this topic. Thank you. Great. Um, Deborah, thank you so much for the presentation on the um, Integrated Concurrent Enrollment Program in Massachusetts and Keith Ogles for your presentation on the Oregon Youth Training Program. They're both wonderful examples. And I think um, we're getting comments in from the um, audience, and people are um, really excited to hear about them. So thank you. And I think they point out both the different pathways that, um, di and different ways of helping young people be successful. So um, I, uh, I want to go to the next slide so somebody can advance that to the slide that says policy issues to consider if possible. Um, I want to just switch our conversation to get a little bit more into, um, thank you, um, some of the policies behind this work and things that um, both policymakers at the state level and also at the district level need to be thinking about. I'm not going to spend much time on, the, on this list. Um, again, I'd love to get feedback from people in the field and ideas about what policies you might know about that are working um, in your area. I'm going to address a few of them. Then we're, we have a couple questions that I want to raise for our presenters. So, the first one, however, uh, changing the way time is used, including extending graduation, I think is something that really um, does need a lot of exploration. Time can be used in many different ways, whether it's a longer day or a longer school year, whether we think about after school weekends in summer, um, whether we think about extended graduation options such as five or six years to age 22 for students with disabilities, um, and allowing students to take fewer credits per year but maybe taking more time to complete. Um, and there are ways to blend secondary and post-secondary education experiences in that as well. And the second bullet relates to um, some of the um, points that Deborah made about dual enrollment and how dual enrollment can be used in um, as an activity and a, and a strategy to help young people um, accelerate um, their path to post-secondary education, but also to help older students who may need to be in, in a setting that's different than the high school setting. 
um, to be with their peers, um, and also gives them an opportunity to experience, um, you know, different a different environment. Um, I would also quickly mention counseling, which is down on the list um, because of all that um, Keith was talking about. We do need more counselors, but we need counselors that are focused on um, counseling and advisement, not just test taking. Um, those who can help perhaps do some more social uh, work, case managers. But counselors need to have a strong knowledge uh, of careers in the emerging labor market so that they can help students um, plan their path to careers. And certainly starting earlier in middle school I think would be an excellent um, job and, and particularly for students with disabilities, planning out their pathway at an early age is important. So I'd like to go to the next slide please um, on issues and questions. So these are questions we're going to use um, for the next several minutes, um, both with our presenters and also with the audience if, 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 if you're interested in these questions. Um, these, are, these are ones that we do want to generate discussion. Um, because they are so critical. So what I'm going to do is just pr very quickly review the questions and then um, ask each presenter to answer one of them. Lou is going to answer the second. Um, Keith is going to answer number or respond to number two and Deborah is going to respond to number three. So let me just quickly review them. Question one is really how can we explore the best balance between aspirations and abilities for all students? And will aspirations look different for students with severe disabilities? And if so, um, how do we make sure that all of the adults in the system are supporting young people to the highest of their abilities? Um, so Lou, that's your question. Um, number two is how to better understand tr transition planning and the process and how to support students with disabilities. Uh, and I think Keith gave us some strategies, but Keith, we'd like you to go even deeper and come up with some more. And um, number three is about how to encourage um, more use of dual enrollment strategies and things like extended graduation that allow that um, allow more time to be used to give students these opportunities um, for students with disabilities. And Deborah, that will be your question. So, Lou, I'm going to turn it over to you to provide some comments on question number one. Um. Hi, this is Joe. Before Lou responds to question number one, I want to again invite uh, participants in the audience to use the chat box to answer, uh, to enter any comments. Um, and uh, you, if your uh, box has collapsed, if you double click on it, it will expand and you can type your question into the text box and send it to us. And we'll read some of those comments as well. Um, if you're addressing a particular one of those questions, just put number one, number two, or number three at the start of your response so we'll know that's the one that you are responding to. Um, and again, as soon uh, after we, uh, while our uh, different uh, presenters are, are responding to the questions, we certainly invite you to add your comments as well. Thank you. Lou. Uh, thank you, Joe and Betsy. Um, as I think about this question, I kind of get, I get, my first reaction is to get a little nervous about questions that um, connect aspirations and abilities because I think in general um, our expectations, uh, particularly expectations of the adults, that is parents and professionals, have been limiting, too limiting for students with disabilities, uh, especially students with severe disabilities. Um, and so um, I do think, as I think about this, that it reinforces for me the, one of the points that Betsy made earlier, the importance of, of self-determination skills, and uh, that is that we explore with students as they're going through school uh, to understand um, their strengths and their abilities, and but to also understand the kinds of supports that they may need as they move forward to post-secondary edu education opportunities and careers. And, um, and that um, uh, we can more actively involve students in high school in, um, in managing, for example, their IEP or the transition plan and begin to give them the set of experiences to kind of take control of their own lives and kind of manage their lives and, and, and think about their aspirations and their careers and think about the supports that they might need and, uh, um, and the kinds of careers uh, that they might um, want to pursue. I do think that also as a part of a, 
uh, secondary school program having the opportunity for uh, dual enrollment programs, I think, um, as well as, as Deborah talked about, and, and the opportunity for work experience as a part of a high school program, as Keith talked about, are also critically important for kids, both to understand better what their aspirations might be, um, but it also gives an opportunity to better understand what kinds of supports that they might need, uh, for example, in the workplace or in a post-secondary education environment. Uh, I do think that given the array of post-secondary education opportunities, we say college and we tend to think of four-year college, but you know, post-secondary education opportunities really include you know, two-year community colleges where large numbers of kids with disabilities, including those with intellectual disabilities, are, already have opportunities in community colleges. Four-year college, but also you know, post-secondary vocational technical schools, which uh, also provide a, a great opportunity for many youth with disabilities. Okay, Thanks. Keith, do you want to take a um, take a shot on question number two, please? Sure. Um, well, I think that the planning process is something that is is really key, and the the process is the key part of that because it's not something that can be done in one IEP meeting. I think that that's a great place to start. Um, you know, many times. Okay you'll have uh, that start in the year the student turns 16. And many times a representative from our agency will go, so we'll have a, a vocational rehab counselor attend that meeting, and they will use that as maybe a starting point in that process, and it's something that they work on for, you know, the, over the, the years they're working in collaboration with the school district, with the parents, with the student, with ideally the student's goals and aspirations in mind. and. And so that's where that um, interagency collaboration comes in. I think it's just it's the most important piece because you'll have um, you'll have more resources and you'll have more supports and services to your you know to your student and available to your student. So in in that idea that this is a process, it's something you're going to do over a long period of time. Many times it's exploration, or you know many people are calling it discovery now, where the students will go and they'll do job shadows. That's all part of the process, and they'll do, um, you know, they'll learn about what further education they're going to need. So all of that is is in that transition um, process, and, and thinking about how to make that successful, you know, transition into that post-secondary life. Do they need to have more experience? Do they need to have more training? And and sometimes we found that. A student is very interested in becoming a, a CNA, or you know, they want to get involved in the medical field, and so it could be that they're going to take a short training in phlebotomy, and they they do that, and then they'll get engaged in that uh, career pathway. Then they'll exit that, and then the school system, through our transition specialist, can help them job develop and help them find employment after they've finished that post-secondary training. And then they get involved in that. And, and because this is a, a long program, we've actually had some of these students come back years later and say, hey, I'm interested in getting more education. Can you help me do that? And, and that's, that's kind of the, the lifelong uh, self-advocacy that you want to see in your students. And that's some of the benefits we've had in thinking of this as a, a longer process and not just something that can be done in one meeting, one meeting at VR or one meeting at school. It's something that is continuous. So. That's kind of my, I guess, recommendation. Great. Thank you. Yes, it's definitely a process. I think we need to understand that. Um, Deborah, how about um, encouraging more dual enrollment and extended graduation options? Any thoughts? I was thinking about having clear policy that fosters or develops incentives for alignment of services and supports across all agencies, both on the federal and state level, um, to direct the, some of that t more toward offering dual enrollment options so that there's some cost sharing going on. Um, I also think that OSEP really needs to be much clearer with LEAs across the country that um, IDA funds, Part B funds, can be used to support students in post-secondary education, not just students with intellectual disabilities, it's a, a cross-disability issue. We run into um, school
school districts nationwide that are saying to us, we're not allowed to use IDEA funds, and that's not the truth. It's incorrect. So that, that that's just that's a simple, somewhat simple fix. I think it's also going to be important for states to take a long look at what the student outcomes are, in particular for students with ID um, in terms of when they exit school. They typically, as I mentioned in my presentation, have some of the poorest outcomes. And I think dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment is, is, is an approach to really changing those outcomes. And I think that information can be used to market um, this idea much more than we currently do, even in the poorest of economic times. If students are becoming more valued members of their community and actually contributing rather than being dependent on the system, I think that speaks volumes. Great. Thank you, Deborah. So I that's my part of the program and I appreciate our two representatives from the programs and Lou responding to the issues and questions that are up. And I'm going to turn it back to Joe to manage the Q and A with the uh, participants. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Betsy, and thank uh, our, both of our uh, uh, presenters. Um, we've been receiving a variety of what I would call questions and comments um, that are, are, in some cases, addressing one of the three questions or adding on to one of the three questions, but then making a comment and then following it up with a question. So I'm going to take a few moments, since we have a few moments left, um, to, to share some of these uh, and then open up the, the question to any of the panelists. And in some cases, I'm going to direct the question to specific panelists. So let's start with a comment by Mary Wright, who says that many of the suggestions for how to improve educational outcomes for students with disabilities sounds very similar to the programs being designed for at-risk, non-disabled students or students in general. Can all groups work together for change? Lou, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I think that's um, exactly right. Um, in fact, I think I, that was one of the point, earlier points I was actually trying to make, is that I think many of the things that we're talking about uh, really stand to benefit um, many kids, including um, the at-risk populations that she was referring to. Um, I do think that um, often, unfortunately, it's the case that um, a lot of uh, supports that are provided to schools are sometimes kind of stovepipe. That is, the money might come from special ed, and so therefore a center might be focused on kids with disabilities. Money might come from Title I, and therefore it might be focused more on um, high poverty kids. So I, so I do think that there we would really benefit from more collaboration that kind of cuts across these silos given that uh, I do agree that uh, many of these strategies are exactly the same strategies we need to be using for all at-risk learners. I'm reminded in your comment, Lou, by, of um, a study that was done by the Chicago Consortium on School Research uh, that was sponsored by the uh, National High School Center two years ago that looked at uh, early warning systems and, their, and the effect on students with disabilities were the cut points, were the indicators similar. And in that, pro in that study, they uh, identified a group of students that we uh, labeled the tubalos, uh, meaning that all the students were at least two years below grade level in, in their uh, reading skills, but they had no special education uh, designation and no history of any previous special ed designation. I think the idea of all students um, you know, and providing services and, and supports for all students gets to that particular group right. also that seems to fall between the, the, crack, uh, the cracks too frequently. Um, I have a, a, some other questions. Um, um, let me, let me uh, address one here that says, this is from Sonia Bartusek. I think that work experience, dual enrollment, or, or enrollment in career tech is vital. But when the community college in the area, most of the businesses won't allow students to work 
even for free, and the Career Tech Center won't allow enrollment without an eighth grade reading level. Um, the parents, special ed teachers, and students get exhausted and discouraged. Um, VR won't come to IEP meetings until their second semester of the senior year, and that is just to provide the application and talk about the services after graduation. So I think there's an, a, a shared um, comment on some of the frustrations um, that are experienced by um, parents and students when they face um, obstacles that they can't, they can't address. Let me uh, switch over now to some, some very good questions that were submitted prior um, as part of the registration process. We, we invited folks to identify particular areas. And I want to, uh, uh, again, highlight, we don't know who these questions are from in most cases, so they're all anonymous for these purposes. But let me uh, pose a question uh, to Deborah. Um, I am especially interested in students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, i.e. the 1%. Where can I learn about strategies that could help them? Deborah? I think that our, you know, this is a little self-serving, but the thinkcollege.net website ha has a lot of information related to that. and. Um, people can feel free to email me and I'll connect them with um, additional information if they have more specific questions. Great, thanks. thanks. Um, Keith, Keith, this is a question to you. What materials and documents are available to distribute to parents and students for realistic planning for college without the support of the IEP? Yeah, that's a, that's a Great question, and um, one of our partner programs at the University of Oregon, which is called Project Access, actually has curriculum on that career and college readiness, and it has downloadable um, documents that you can start working on. It, it can be school-based, where they can actually work in a classroom, or it can be home-based, where um, the parents or, or guardians can work directly with the students, or even it can be self-led by the students, and, and again, this is kind of uh, self-serving, but it's, uh, it's at the Project Access website, and the address is uh, just one word, projectaccess.uoregon.edu. So that's one place where we already have a lot of that curriculum up online, and you can, um, you can download all of the different lessons and, and the materials on that. Um, so that's one good place, and then um, I would, you know, say our website, the YTPOregon.org website, is another good place. Great. Both Deborah and Keith, I don't think it's self-serving to share good resources. So we appreciate your suggesting and uh, some of these options. And if you can think of a few more over the next few days, we'll be glad to uh, put together a list and post it um, along with, uh, and I'll be talking uh, along with the recordings and the other materials, and I'll be talking about how we're going to do that in a few minutes. Um, so, Betsy, let's, let's uh, tap some of your uh, CTE knowledge and skills to ask the question, how can we engage the career education centers in involving special education students in their programs? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of this relates to um, the lack of knowledge about students with disabilities on the part of um, other educators um, that may not understand um, enough of, of what those young people need and how they learn, and that it's a matter of doing like cross training and and um, more professional development um, across all of all of education, so that general education, including CTE. Teachers and instructors, along with special educators, um, have more uh, opportunities to train and to um, learn about instructional strategies um, and how to differentiate instruction for all kids. So part of it, I think, is just building out an awareness on the part of the teachers and getting them to um, have a greater uh, supply of, uh, if you will, arrows in their quiver so that they can um, differentiate their instruction and um, and help all young people learn. So that's one aspect. The other is um, 
having more guidance, um, guidance counselors and career counselors um, to help young people think through what makes sense for them based on their interests and also their abilities. Uh, and then to think about how, how you can design a pathway that might include career and technical education. The one good thing about career and tech ed that I think has changed a lot in the last couple of years is that um, it's not a dead end um, pathway any longer, um, that the, it has become a much more rigorous pathway with much stronger academics. So the fear that if you were pushed into or, or told to go into a career tech ed or voc ed pathway that, that was kind of a dead end, I think doesn't really um, hold truth um, anymore. In, I have to say you will always find exceptions, but for the most part, um, CTE has changed a lot. And so it's also a matter of having um, folks from special ed and general ed have a better sense of what CTE can offer, both in terms of preparing um, kids for, for careers, um, but also in terms of really engaging young people in um, learning that's relevant and meaningful to them. So I, to me, it's, it's a matter of pulling these different silos of education more closely together and helping them understand the benefits that they, um, that they offer to students and then help, helping the teachers and the instructors to work more closely together. Great. Thanks, Betsy. So here's a, a, a combination comment and question that I'm going to pose to Lou about assessment. Best practices indicate that we use universal design for learning strategies when teaching our students. As a special ed education school, we plan for and implement these techniques on a constant basis, including this year. Ladies and gentlemen, the speaker's line has disconnected. I will step away to dial out to him. Hi. Um, sorry, we, we, there was some kind of a disconnection. Uh, we're back on now and uh, have a few minutes, so I'm going to reread and repost <laughs> the, the last question to Lou. Best practices indicate that we use a universal design for learning strategies when teaching our students. As a special education school, we plan for and implement these techniques on a constant basis including this year when we created our Common Core line tasks in English language arts and math. However, there is a big discrepancy when our students then have to participate in standardized exams with no UDL strategies built in, uh, pictures, highlighted words, graphic organizers, etc. In, the the, in the future of Common Core, will there be a difference in the assessment given to students with special needs as opposed to the assessments given to general education students? Although we have multiple ways to show growth and progress with our students, the state exams merely incite stress and emotional outbursts for our students. Well, I think the short answer to that is that I, that I hope that those um, um, UDL principles are also applied in assessments that are designed based on Common Core. I know that I think within the broader disability community there's a you know, recognition the importance of um, UDL in the design of assessments, um, and I think that the uh, consortia that are currently working on assessments certainly have had input uh, from a broad array of professionals, um, advocates, parents, and others about the importance of uh, these um, uh, accommodations in assessment for youth with disabilities. Uh, I do know that one of the consortia is working on 
computer adapted assessment, and I think that provides an opportunity for um, a, a, a greater degree of um, of accommodation for students with disabilities in the administration of assessments. It also provides an ability. You mentioned students being frustrated. I think one of the problems with a lot of the state assessments currently, particularly the ones that are uh, the ones that are presented um, um, on paper, is that they don't have the flexibility to present students with, uh, at least initially, with items that were that are kind of within their ability range. And so it may be that the first item they attempt is one that they can't do. And of course, a lot of kids faced with that may just shut down and so it's clearly not a way to you know maximize their performance. So I, I do think that there are reasons for some optimism, but on the other hand, it's important that people stay the broader community uh, is vigilant and attentive to these issues um, um, uh, as the consortia work and the work to um, put these assessments in place continue. Thanks, Lou. Um, I noticed uh, we're getting close to the end of the of the webinar, so I want to uh, um, very quickly, if possible, um, give a quick review, and then this is an answer to questions about going forward from here, uh, the materials being posted, which they will be posted before the end of the week. Uh, this recording will be posted, the slides will be posted. Um, on our website at www.betterhighschools.org, um, where uh, you can also find materials from the previous webinars as well. But I also uh, want to see if we can quickly ask Helen Duffy. Helen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, to give us a quick uh, introduction to our uh, community, our college and career readiness community of practice, where we will post the comments that we receive, the questions with answers uh, over the next uh, week, um, and want to invite uh, people listening in today, if you're not a member, to join our community of practice, and uh, we'll, we will um, try to continue this conversation among all the participants and anybody else who wishes to join us. Helen, why don't you give a quick uh, run through of the community? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, and thanks to all of you who have been participating online during the webinar today. What we'd like to do is offer the community of practice as a, a forum uh, for you to continue this uh, important discussion. Um, we launched this community earlier this month, and uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit about how you can access the community. Um, and talk about a couple of the questions that we've got, uh, discussion threads that we've we've got going there. So uh, if you go to this uh, URL, um, community.betterhighschools.org, you'll come to this page here. Um, and if you're already a member of one of the other National High School Center um, communities of practice, you can sign in and you'll scroll down and find the College and Career Readiness Group logo and you just simply click there and you'll be taken to the uh, College and uh, Career Readiness uh, landing page. If you're new to the community, um, there's a box on the right-hand side inviting you to join and learn more. Uh, we'd ask you to complete the, that, uh, that box and click on Join Our Community and uh, you'll get an email with instructions on how to access the community. Uh, once you're in the community, you can uh, read and comment on resources and publications, interact with other members in discussion forums, and that's what I wanted to just briefly um, introduce today. There are a number of discussion threads we've got uh, launched, one of which addresses extended graduation options for students with disabilities, another on transitions into college and career pathways for students with disabilities, um, college and career aspirations and abilities uh, for students with disabilities, and finally something that Deborah raised in her, um, in her comments, and that is the, the important role of counselors in uh, assisting students in their uh, college and career planning. So I just wanted to just briefly introduce the, the uh, community. Uh, invite you all. We, we understand that we've managed to bring a number of experts uh, and resources to the table today. 
but also acknowledge that there's a, a wide range of expertise out in the field, and we can all learn from one another. So I hope the conversation can continue. Thanks, Helen. So as we're now winding down, I do want to invite our various presenters to take a moment, or uh, if you wish, to uh, um, give some closing remarks for, uh, for the group today. So why don't we start uh, with you, Lou? Okay, uh, thanks, Joe, for this opportunity. I think it's great the High School Center um, uh, hosted this webinar um, focused on students with disabilities. I, I think probably I've mentioned a few times before the importance of self-determination skills. And, um, and I might add uh, to what I've said already that a lot of the work in self-determination has tended to focus on kids with, uh, with intellectual disabilities. There's kind of a body of literature there. Um, the, the one thing I think that's important is that I think that uh, as a field that we should consider the importance of expanding the importance of self-determination skills uh, to a broader array of kids with disabilities, and including kids with high incidence disabilities like learning disabilities and ADHD, because I think many of these students are also uh, ill-equipped as young adults in uh, either in post-secondary education in their career to kind of understand their their strengths, the supports they need. Um, uh, I think I think sometimes these you know, these young adults think their disabilities end at the school schoolhouse door, and unfortunately, I think for many of them, they continue their disabilities continue to be evident in both post-secondary education as well as uh, work environments. Great, um, and thanks, Lou. Um, so, uh, Betsy, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, one final message you'd like to leave with participants? Well, that I'm extremely pleased to be um, having the conversation about um, promoting and, and advocating for more students with disabilities to be college and career ready. I think the, the change in the conversation is great and really setting higher expectations for all students is good. Um, by when we set higher expectations though, that means that we all have to step up to the plate and make sure that we're doing what we need to do as the adults around these young people to help them get there. We can't just send them off on their own. So um, it's a challenge for all, all the adults in the system, but I think the expectations and the goals are the right ones. Great. Thank you. Deborah? Sure. I, I'd really like to end by thanking you, um, the National High School Center, for including students with intellectual disabilities in your discussion on college and career readiness. I really want to emphasize that because more often than not, these particular uh, youth are often omitted from this conversation. So I applaud you for that. And I want to thank you for your dedication and, and leadership in this field. Um, I know um, from Lou and others that you are a nationally renowned expert in this topic area. So we're pleased that you could join us today. Um, Keith, how about you? Yeah, the same. I just want to say thanks for uh, the invitation to be able to participate in this talk today. And definitely to everybody that is still participating, think about um, just partnerships with agencies in the community beyond just the, the secondary education and school districts. Because as we all know right now, the, the budgetary climate we're working in, we all need to collaborate with each other. And there was some talk earlier about VR not having the capacity to come until the second semester of a high school senior, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the climate we're working in. So we need to reach out and create these partnerships and work together because we're all working to the same, to meet the same goals for these students, and that's the that's the primary concern that we should have. And I just appreciate times like this that we can all come together and share these best practices. So thanks again. Thank you. So um, in closing now, I do want to remind everybody or share with everybody the fact that the uh, National High School Center uh, is a model for collaboration and, and uh, integration because, and we're proud to say that we're duly funded by the Office of Special Education Programs and the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, we're one of three content centers that are funded as part of the Comprehensive Center Network, but there are also several other OSEP-funded centers that focus on 
uh, college and career ready technical assistance. And on your screen right now, you see the access to the, the names and access to those centers. We want to invite you um, to visit them because they have good, very good resources around uh, transitions and uh, dropout prevention and post-school uh, post outcomes. But also, in addition to these centers, I want to call your attention to several other OSEP-funded TA centers that do, relate, that do work that re, uh, is related to and supports college and career readiness, though somewhat more indirectly than directly. So um, I hope that these, uh, these resources have been valuable to you, and I want to remind all of the participants that we have one more uh, webinar in this series that will be next, sat next uh, Tuesday focusing on aligning resources, structures, and supports for actualizing college and career readiness. So the focus of that discussion is going to be around the challenges of alignment. Finally. There's multiple ways to get in touch with the National High School Center, one of the newest being our uh, um, community of practice. We highly encourage you to join and continue this conversation, and we will invite our presenters and direct to our presenters questions that have emerged during the conversations today um, that we were unable to get, get to. Um, again, thanks to all of the presenters and thanks to all the participants. I think uh, we strongly believe in the uh, National High School Center that when, you, uh, when schools and school districts meet the needs of students with disabilities and have programs and supports that do that, then all students benefit. Um, whereas when they only focus on the needs of general education students, then many general education students and many special ed ed education students are left out uh, of that process. So we encourage you to continue your individual work, and we look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you.